All right, guys. Last week we finished our study on the fruit of the spirit. Um, I, I know you're sad that the first things we're not doing together this morning is let's go through those fruit of the spirit. For the fruit of the spirit is love. I know you're sad that we're not turning over to Galatians five yet again. Um, by the way, we're going from one chapter five to another. So if you do want to go ahead and open your Bibles, we'll be in Matthew chapter five today. So, um, that, so here's the thing. Uh, real, real quick before I kind of talk about where we're going. You know, part of where we're going is trying to get in line with some of the reading plan uh, as we as we discuss things as a group. Um, if you take a plan uh, on this. These square boxes. I've had this question asked to me by a couple people. It's like, why do we have a focus passage, right? Why is there a focus passage on this? And and maybe you're thinking also, why does it not necessarily line up with what we've read this week, right? Uh, and so and so um, the focus passage. Really, the intent is this is a chance for us to talk in more detail over something as a group. Um, and so the whole idea is maybe you're doing a, a study with some other people in our church family, or maybe you're doing uh, – we're teaching the youth or the kids or whatever. What if we had a focus passage that we're all on the same page on, that we're looking in depth on? And so that's kind of the idea. Well, I'd like for us on Sunday mornings, we're going to have to play some catch-up, and I don't know if I can catch up because you see how long it took me to get through the fruit of the Spirit, two, two verses. But – uh, we're going to try to, with time, get onto the same page as our reading plan. So we're all so that way you know when you come in here, unless God changes the sermon that week, which He could do, and we're open to that, where we're going to be. Okay, so I think that's going to help us as we dig into God's Word together. Uh, if we're if we're having some of those discussions and we know where we are, so this week's focus passage, if you have your little thing, is Matthew chapter five, verses thirty three to thirty seven. There's a lot of meat there. We'll get there, I promise. We'll get there here in the weeks to come. But 33 to 37 is talking about how you, you're, you know, don't bear false vows and all these different things. And, and basically if you make your yes be yes, your no be no. We'll get there, guys. We're going to have a whole sermon probably dedicated to some of those things. But that is what we're doing. Let's get on the same page where we know what the sermon's going to be on. Like I said, God can change that at any moment and we're open to that. Uh, but that's kind of what we're going to do. So. We're going to start looking at the Sermon on the Mount. So read with me. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to make it through two verses this morning. Here we go. You ready? All right. Matthew chapter 5 verse 1. Here we go. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, pray with me. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in us and through us. Thank you for every person here this morning and all those that are a part of our body that can't be here this morning. God, you have blessed us. Thank you for taking us through the fruit of the Spirit together. And God, as we start opening your word in this Sermon on the Mount series, God, it's so big. Father, you have packed so much into Matthew 5 through 7. God, teach us, mold us, shape us. Help us to be the disciples you call us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the reason why we're only making it through two verses. By the way, if I trip over this word, please don't laugh. Okay, because I like to walk around, just so you know. Um, the, only, the reason why we're only making it through two verses this morning is we really need to understand the context of where we're starting from. Because that, that's really something that, that makes it more powerful once we understand the full context. So the, what's the big picture of the Sermon on the Mount? Well, let's start out. This is how I always like teaching. Let's talk about the book of Matthew first. Okay? Let's talk about the book of Matthew. You see, the, the, the four gospel writers have four different audiences that they're writing to. And so who is the audience... For Matthew. Who is the book of Matthew written to? Any idea? Is it to a Greek audience, a Roman audience? Is it to Jews? Is it to. Who, who is Matthew's audience? Jews. Jews. Okay, good. 
So, for instance, the book of Luke is written to a Roman audience. That's why there's very specific things that Luke is doing, okay, because of his audience of who he's writing to. Whereas Matthew has a very different way of going about what he's saying because he knows his audience. He knows how to teach them. Okay, so so Matthew, the book of Matthew, if you look at Matthew chapter one, begins with what? Genealogy, right? And, it, you know, we look at it, and we're like, oh, my goodness. Do we really have to read a bunch of names? You know, now, if you're a Jew, this is the record. Matthew is trying to make his case. This is a record of the Messiah. He's trying to make a case that, OK, guys, you know your word, right? You know, we say the Old Testament. They say the Tanakh. You know your Tanakh. You know scripture. You know that in the Tanakh. It is pointing to a Messiah, a king that's going to come. So the reason why he starts with genealogy is he's like, you've got to see that it's the fulfillment of everything you know when you're reading your Tanakh. So Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it says specifically, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the one that you're looking for in the Old Testament, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Why is that important? Well, in Isaiah 11, it says that the Messiah is going to come from the line of David. Do you see where Matthew saying, yeah, yeah, I'm going to show you how he's from the line of David. This is fulfilling your prophecy. Genesis 12, the whole world will be blessed by the seed of Abraham. It's a picture of the Messiah is going to come from the seed of Abraham. So he begins Matthew 1, 1. Jesus came from both. He, he is the fulfillment of the scriptures you already know. He is the fulfillment of. Of both, okay. So, did you know the Book of Matthew has 54 direct quotes from the Old Testament? Direct quotes, straight out, 54 times in the Book of Matthew, you see him quote what scripture they already know, and then you see over 260 times an allusion to the Old Testament. So that's over 300 times. Matthew is directly saying. You, this is what you know to be true. See, because he knows his audience. They know scripture. What is the second closest gospel that has Old Testament references? You got option of three to choose from. I think it's Luke, Mark, or John. John, any other guesses? Mark. Okay, any other guesses? Luke, okay, so we got them all covered. The answer is Mark. So here's the thing. So over 300 in the book of Matthew, do you know how many Old Testament references Mark has? 31. Do you see the difference? We have... We have Matthew knowing his audience. And that's why... So I need you to hear that as the backdrop... Of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, that's going to come to play as we discuss things going forward. Um, there, how many other Gospels also include the story of the Sermon on the Mount? The answer is one. The book of Luke, and he actually in Luke calls it something different. It's honestly the Sermon on the Plain there. Luke 6, 17 says Jesus went up to the plain. Now, you may say that's two different stories, and that's fine. We'll talk about that. I believe they're the same story for many different reasons. But they call it more of the Sermon on the Plain. Now, why do you think – I want you to think about this. Why do you think Luke describes it as a plain and Matthew describes it as the Sermon on the Mount? Because if you read that, you're either in your brain saying, okay, that's two different stories, or you understand the context that Matthew's trying to make a point. I, I'll, by the way, open trip next year. If you didn't know, come to Israel with me because we will go to the site of, and basically every person agrees where this happened. This is not like, well, maybe it's over here or maybe it's over there. We know where the Sermon on the Mount, every scholar agrees on this site. Okay? Come with me and let's unpack this together. Okay? And I will show you how those are not two different views. Okay, they're actually, it's just two different vantage points. And we'll talk about that when we're there, if you come with me down. But why would Matthew say he went up on the mountain? 
Jewish audience. Okay, Moses starts by getting the law. Now, I'm not saying Jesus is not getting law here. We'll get into that. But if you're writing to a Jewish audience and they have this view of Moses being the one that God spoke to and the one that God spoke through, he's trying to make a point about Jesus is someone to listen to, just like Moses. Now, this, by the way, this is not the first time that he's made the point of Moses in the book of Matthew. So I want you to think about this. He says he ascends the mount. Okay, that's the same thing as Moses. Let's think about a few others. Um, Matthew 2.15. Okay, Matthew 2.15 says this. He remained there until the death of Herod. This is Jesus. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Jesus, Egypt I called my son. Do you know who that is a reference to? That is a reference to Moses, Hosea 11.1. 1. That text is not about Jesus. That text is about Moses. And all of a sudden, Matthew's using it to say, Jesus also came out of Egypt. Hmm, my audience, you better listen to this man. God's doing something just like God took us out of Egypt with Moses. Now we have the Messiah that did the exact same thing. Then, go down one verse, I believe. Yeah, go down one verse. Here's what it says. Verse 16. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he came very enraged. He sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinities from two-year-olds and under. Now, do you remember another story? We're at the birth. There's a, there's a ruler slaughtering male children. Hmm, sounds like Pharaoh to me. Do you see these connections that Matthew is bringing out to say, you know what? Moses was someone God used. Jesus is going down some of these same paths. Don't miss him. Don't miss him. Okay, Matthew 4. Look at Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Okay, do you know of someone else that the Bible says was led into the wilderness? And there's a connection of 42. Moses, Deuteronomy 8, 2, says that Moses was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 years. And if you're a Jew, and all of a sudden Matthew is writing that Jesus also was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, and there's a number of 40 attached, do you see the parallels? And I could give you 20 more, easily. Okay, This is just a few. And I want you to see this, that, that there is parallels between... What Jesus did and what Moses did. Okay, now don't lose sight of that as we continue our discussion. But here's what Matthew's doing. He knows his audience. That's so important, guys, to know your audience that you're trying to talk to the gospel about. Right? If you have a friend and you're trying to talk to them about Jesus and what he's done, you're not changing the message. But do you see how the gospel writers catered it to who their audience was? And that's exactly what Matthew's doing here. Um, but here's what's going on. You have a group of people, these Jews, did they know the scripture? At the time of Jesus, they knew their Bible. They, and, and they loved their Bible. Now, they got it stuff wrong. Don't, don't get me wrong. But they did know their Bible. And that's who he's talking to. Okay, now let's talk about the, the immediate setting of the Sermon on the Mount. Now that we have kind of the overall picture of who Matthew's writing to, that'll come back later as we talk. Uh, let's talk about the setting. Tracy mentioned a minute ago that it was in Luke as well, Luke chapter 6. And I would encourage you at some point this week to also read the account of Luke chapter 6. Okay? Now, of all the gospel accounts, Luke is the only one that says, I did my very best to put it in, in, in the scripture says in consecutive order. I, I did my very best. Now I'm not saying that everything in Luke is exactly on a chronological time frame. It's not. But of all the of all the different gospels, Luke is the only one that says in Luke chapter one verse three that I did my best to put it in in, in order. Okay, I give you an orderly account, a consecutive order. Uh, it says in my Bible. Now, why is that important? In the book of Matthew. 
especially to a Jewish audience. Have you ever read the Old Testament and like you're 18 chapters later and something happened that happened before something that happened 18 chapters earlier? You ever seen that before? Like you're going along in like Second Kings or something and next thing you know you see, wait a minute, that happened before this. Why are we jumping back in time? Well, a Jewish audience, they don't, they don't write in chronological order typically. Okay, They put things together. They're trying to make points, and Matthew frequently does that too. Okay, So that's why you're like, wait a minute, this is way early in Matthew. It's way late in Luke. Where, where does it fit? Well, that's because of the, the writing style. We have to understand that. Now, the reason why I say all that is I want you to think about Luke 6. What is the immediate setting of the Sermon on the Mount? Here's what I believe it is based on Luke 6. Jesus went up to a mountain all night to pray. What's he praying for? All night. Choosing the twelve, right? He spends all night in prayer at the top of the mountain. Wherever that is, I believe. Anyway, we'll talk about that some other time. In the morning, he chooses the twelve, essentially. God, which which ones of these followers are the twelve is what it says in Luke 6. He comes down the mountain. There are people touching him and people are being healed. Just amazing things happening, right? And all of a sudden it says there's these large crowds following him. And that's when he goes up on the plane and he gives this sermon on the mount. Um, so so it, it, that is when, in the whole big context of, 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 of when did this thing even happen. So I want you to think about this early on in his ministry. That's, that's in Matthew as well. No matter what, it's right after he chooses some disciples is when this happens. So this is the very first thing publicly that Jesus is giving a sermon on. Do you think that is important? I mean, if he is around 30 years old, I'm thinking his first sermon is going to be a humdinger. Like, I, God, I, I, you've, been, you've been training me all these years. I'm ready to give that sermon, right? Either way, it's, it's, one of, it's the very first thing that he really comes to teach. Okay, so that's, that, to me that's important. So look at Matthew 4.23. Look at what's going on. Okay, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, so he'd just chosen the disciples. He's going all throughout Galilee. What is he doing? Three things. What did Jesus come to do? Teaching in their synagogues. Preaching or, uh, let me see, mine says proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So he's talking about the kingdom. That's important. The whole context of the Sermon on the Mount is the kingdom. Okay, and three, healing. Every kind of disease, every kind of sickness among the people. So you see Jesus coming, and he's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing. Now, something you may never have seen before. Do you realize that Matthew is saying this is what he came to do? Matthew chapter 5 through 7, what's he doing? He's teaching and preaching. Matthew 8 and 9, what's he doing? He's healing. So Matthew says, this is what he came to do, and then here we go. Here he is, the Sermon on the Mount, all the teaching and preaching. What was the passionate thing that, God, that Jesus wanted you to know? And then let me also show you how he's healing all these people in Matthew 8 and 9. So Matthew is showing you Jesus living out what he said he was doing. Okay, now here's my question. Jesus is doing all these things. Were people drawn to Jesus at this time? Absolutely. Look at, look at verses 24 and 25 of chapter 4. The news about him spread throughout all Syria. They brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains and demoniacs and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So you have Jesus and all these people come. They're drawn to this, right? I mean, this man, people are truly being healed. I mean, he has the words of life. Like, this is incredible. And people are coming from all over. Now, let me ask you a question about the Sermon on the Mount. We'll chew on this probably the whole time and when we do the series. My question to you is, did Jesus give a similar message or a different message from what the people knew in the Old Testament? In their tongue. Different. Okay. And we're going to keep chewing on some of these things. Because he does have an immediate audience. So he's going to say some things you'll see. That they agree with. Like that are straight out of the Tanakh. But he has a 
spin on it for sure. But we'll, we'll get to that. Let me give you one quick example, though. Um, the Old Testament in Malachi. Have you ever looked to see how it ends in the book of Malachi? Did you know Malachi 4, 6 ends with, okay, you are off base. I want you to come back to me. But you know what's going to happen? You're going to have a curse. It ends with a curse in Malachi 4. It says, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. But lest I come and smite the land with a curse. That's the last little bit in the book of Malachi is I, I may have to curse you. And then there's 400 years of silence. But that's the last thing they heard from God is, guys, y'all got to come back to me or I'm going to have a curse. And next thing you know, he just stops speaking for 400 years. And all of a sudden, if you just put yourself in that context, can you imagine where you had all these things that God was doing, all these prophets, all these different things, and that God was speaking, and all of a sudden, silence. After he just said, I'm going to curse you. That's how the Old Testament ends. Then Jesus comes. And I want you to see this. In his very first public address, his very first sermon, how does it begin? It begins with, blessed are you. It begins with blessing and grace and mercy. I want you to see the contrast there. That at the end of the law, in the Old Testament, God's saying, mm, there's a curse. There's 400 years of silence. And the very first thing Jesus talks about publicly in the sermon is blessing. Okay, that's a very different message than the last thing they heard. And I, I, what we're going to see on the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is interested in the hearts of the people. Jesus is interested in their heart more than anything else. And we're going to see him flip the script of what they think the kingdom is about. See, if you put yourself in Galilee, in Israel... First century. Are things going well for you? Who is oppressing the Jews? Okay, you have Rome oppressing the Jews. As a matter of fact, about 60% of anything you bring in goes straight into taxes for Rome. 60%. Okay? So you are being oppressed like no other time as far as where you, you're like, oh my goodness. What do you want the Messiah to come and do? Listen. When his people were being oppressed in Egypt, what did God come and do? He sent Moses. He sent this hero, right? Let's get Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you better do this. Okay, well let's just kill all the, you know... It, he did amazing things through Moses to free his people. That's what they're wanting out of the Messiah. Like we're being oppressed. We don't know where to go. That's what you're looking for is the same thing they've already had. They're wanting Joshua. They're wanting Moses. They're wanting these great heroes of the faith that came in and freed them because that's where they are. That is where they are. Now, that's not what Jesus came in. His first sermon, it says, blessed are you if you're poor in spirit. Blessed are you if you mourn. Blessed are you if you're merciful, if you're gentle, if you're a peacemaker. That's what makes you blessed. He doesn't come in and say, you know what, I'm ready to, y'all are getting just absolutely shattered for no good reason. I'm going to stand up. What are we going to, where, where do y'all want to go? Y'all want to go back to Egypt? Well, where, where do we want to go? Because I can, I can take us there. I'm the Messiah. It's not what he does. He says, you know what? I know you feel oppressed right now. I know you feel like you have nowhere to go. I know you're, but you know what? You're not cursed. You're blessed. And, and we're going to unpack those Beatitudes next week. But I, but I want you to see, that's a radical message, right? Because in their day, if things were not going right, what did that mean? Was God happy with you? See, they thought that if things were not going right, that means God is cursing you for some reason. You, you weren't taking his word seriously. You weren't doing everything right. And Jesus came with a radical message that says, no, no, no. When you're poor in spirit, when you're hurting, 
When you're all these things, you're blessed. You're not cursed. You're blessed. Now, if you think about it, what types of people does that message attract? You ever thought of that? Does that attract the rich and powerful? That attracts the weak. Do you understand? In first century, do you know who Jesus' inner circle was? Do you know who was coming in these large crowds? Was it the people that were of high status? Absolutely not. It was the weak. It was the so here's the thing. The weak were the ones attracted to his message. So the, the basis of Christianity was untrained men, uneducated men. Weak men in the world's eyes, people that were like fishermen. By the way, if you're a fisherman, that is not a good trade in their day. I don't know what you think about with fishermen. It's not like today. I don't even know what you think about with fishermen today. But what I'm saying is that is the worst of the worst job if you're a Jew. And you can ask me why later. I'd be happy to, to explain that. But that is not a desirable profession. I'll just tell you that. Okay? But that's the people Jesus chose this week. My mind went to 1 Corinthians when I was thinking about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me, let me read you chapter 1 verses 26 and following. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many mobile. Noble, not mobile. Uh, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world to despise uh, uh, and despise God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. That is 1 Corinthians 1 verses 26 to 29. Some of you are like me. Some of you are like, oh, he's going to talk about sports again. But sports were something that were important to me growing up. <laughs> So a lot of my illustrations, as you can always hear, kind of deal with different sports things. Sorry, that's just part of it. Um, I remember in Little League. Back then, there was no Facebook. There was no easy way to but, – but I remember the days that my team, our team, was chosen, right, in Little League. And I remember trying to call around to my buddies, hey, did you get on uh, you know, this team? Did you get on the same team? Did you get on Gary Simmons' baseball team, you know, or whatever it was? And so I would call around asking, did you get on this team, right? Now, I want you to think about a baseball team. If you're choosing – I know this is a, a jump. If you're choosing a lineup in baseball, where do you put the best hitters? Okay. All right. So definitely early in the lineup, but the powerful hitters a lot of times are like cleanup, right? Fourth, third, fourth batters, right? That that is it, now, now the, the, just if you don't know baseball, the reason for that is first and second batters. You're trying to get on base. Third and fourth batters, let's knock them in, right? So you want a powerful hitter, third and fourth, right? So so now I want you to think about this because I was never a cleanup. I was always a leadoff man because I can't hit the ball very far, but I could run kind of fast back then. Not so much today, uh, but but that was that was where I was. Now what I love. As I was thinking about this, is Jesus didn't come and say, I want a bunch of cleanup men. Jesus didn't come and say, I'm looking for the powerful ones that had this huge ministry, and that's who I'm going to use to promote my ministry. No, that's not what he did. He actually chose those that usually bat ninth in the lineup. The ones that nobody else really wants. They're like, let's just hide you at the very end of the lineup because you might not come to bat as many times in a game. That's the ones he came, probably the ones that are actually on the bench, don't even get to play. That's really the ones he came and chose. And, and I tell you that to say this. We have an enemy that wants us to believe that, that we just don't measure up. That we've either made too many mistakes or that we're just not good enough or we don't have the gifts of that person. And what what you got to understand is that's exactly who God wants to use. He wants people that understand, I can't do this in my power, God. I have no hope of hitting that home run, God. I have no power. I need you to do it through me. And it's when that ninth batter who was puny in Little League, if he came up and he hit a home run, 
They're like, where did that come from? I've watched him in practice all these years, and he can't hit it to first base, much less a home run. I've never seen him hit it out of the infield. What on earth just happened? And that's exactly what God wants. He wants us to understand it's not about us. He wants us to understand that he did give us the Holy Spirit who has all the power that you could possibly imagine. And our job is to say, you know what, God? It's not about me. Use me. Use me. And you may think, you know what? I don't measure up. That is a lie from the enemy. God can and will use all of us. The most unlikely people. (laughs) He loves to use the one that nobody expects. Now, let me ask you this. Deep down, are you open to being used however God sees fit? Because that's scary. Sometimes that puts you in situations where you're like, God, if you don't come through in this, this is going to fail miserably. I'm going to fall on my face. So your power has to be on full display because I can't do it. When's the last time you were in a situation where you had to rely that much on God? That God, I, if, if you don't come through right here, there's no hope of success. I, I believe if you look at these circles in Christianity, you have untrained men, fishermen. They're, they're not educated. And yet God uses them in circles you can't even imagine with this religious elite who know their scriptures backwards and forwards. And the only explanation, you know, look at Acts 4. The only explanation these people had was, what is going on here? How is this even happening? And I think if we yield to the Holy Spirit, if we yield to what God has for us, there's going to be people saying, what's going on here? How is this even possible? Matthew 5.1. That that whole introduction was to get us to Matthew 5.1. So I wanted you to understand, first off, the book of Matthew written to Jews. Second off, where are they? Okay, where are these people? Okay, Matthew 5.1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came up to him. Now let's just start first where Jesus saw the crowds. Okay, so if Jesus just chose some disciples, okay, he just chose some disciples, people were healing him, he was healing people, all these things. He essentially, I love this, I can picture this happening. He comes down from the mountain he prayed on, apparently, and he's right around the Sea of Galilee, which is where Capernaum is, his hometown for three years, okay? And it says he kind of goes up in Matthew to give this sermon. And and I love that first off. I want you to see, we'll we'll talk about that because in that area, I've been asked this by several people, like how on earth could they hear, if if there's these big crowd, how could they hear Jesus? Like how could they hear his voice? They didn't have mics. They didn't have all these things. How could they hear? Well, the answer is when you go to that spot beside the Sea of Galilee with the topography and the hard ground, it bounces off like crazy. You don't need a mic. I mean, there, there's a great YouTube video. I wish I had it on here. There's a great YouTube video where these two guys went to this spot, and one was down kind of on the lower side, and the other one went up higher. No mics, nothing, and he just starts speaking in normal voice. And the guy is way up, way up the mountain, and you can hear it as clear as day. He's not raising his voice. He's just talking normally. It's because of the topography. I want you to understand it can happen. This is not a fairy tale. It can happen, and it does happen. Okay. So he comes to this, this spot that's right off the Sea of Galilee. It kind of goes up, okay, and it makes an amphitheater. So picture that in your mind, this little amphitheater that, that Jesus makes because of the topography. And then it says that he saw the crowds. Okay. Where were, the, where were these crowds from, by the way? What did it say? Was it all from Galilee? Well, back at the end of chapter 4. They're from all over. People are hearing about what, what Jesus is doing. And they're coming from 
By the way, do you know how far Jerusalem is? Just to give you an idea how far they came, you know how far Jerusalem is? It's about 128 miles. Do you see how far people are? They, they, they don't have mass transit. There's no bus to take. People are hearing about what Jesus is doing and coming from all over. Decapolis, that is a Greek place that you would not expect people to be coming from. They're hearing about what Jesus has done. And here they come, these large crowds, okay? And it says he saw them. Now here's something that, that one of the things you're going to hear me do a lot, and I'm sorry, not sorry, but I love going back to the original language. And here's why. If you just see that he saw them, did you know there's several words for see in Greek language? There's not just one. There's multiple words for see. And he could have just said he physically saw the crowds. Like, oh man, look at all these people. Let me sit down and start teaching. That's not what that word means. The word means I see someone and I realize the spiritual condition and the reality of the weight of the moment. It's a much bigger word than physically just seeing something. Like, you know what I'm talking about. You can see something happen and recognize the weight of what just happened. That's where Jesus is. Okay? He recognizes, oh my goodness, look at this crowd. Here I've killed a few people and I've done a few things. And oh my God, what have you blessed me with right here? He recognizes the weight of the moment. Okay? When he saw that crowd. He recognized. And, and it was more than just, let me go give him a sermon. It's the weight of man. God, you created all these people. I love them. It's, 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 it's compassion. Like, I want to teach them it's not about the law. They all think it is. They all think it's about it. It's about observing every law and every command. I need to show them it's bigger than that. The kingdom is not about what they did. They said, man, I see them and I love them. So let's talk to them. Because of, of, of who they are, let's talk to them. And it says that he sat down. Now, this is how I know God put me at this time in my, uh, of, the, of the whole thing. Because do you know how they taught back then? In Jesus' day, you teach seated. I can't do that. Have you ever seen me up here try to teach seated? That one time we did that circle, if you were here. I had to stand up one time. and just I can't, I can't. It's hard for me to teach seated. I'll just be honest. So it's not like I'm trying to be domineering or anything. It's just I have this... Energy, and if I'm sitting seated, I'm like, I gotta get up, I gotta get up. And it's not that I need to go to the bathroom, okay? If you ever see me do that, it's, I can't help it. But in their day, if you go to a synagogue today, when you come to Israel with me next summer, and we go to a synagogue in Chorazin, you're gonna see this on full display. There's something there in every synagogue in Jesus' day. There's seven elements of every synagogue. One of them is. Something called the Moses Seat. Do you know what the Moses Seat is? Okay. Well, good deduction based on our sermon this morning. Uh, the Moses Seat, okay, is the seat that the one giving the message would sit in. Why would they call it the Moses Seat? Who did God give the commandments to? So you're opening God's word. You always, always, always open the Torah. Every single synagogue service, you're going to have a Torah passage. That's why it's the Moses seat. Who is the person that's going to explain the sermon based on the Torah sits in Moses' seat. And here's what they do. You stand up to read the scroll, to read God's word. The Hazan, which is the caretaker of the synagogue, goes and puts it back in the Torah closet. For those of you that have been in Israel with me, you know what I'm talking about. Then, whoever is given the sermon sits back down in the Moses seat to deliver the sermon. It's a sign of authority. That I'm speaking on behalf of God, and I'm speaking the words that God has for me. Okay, so you stand up to read God's word, you sit back down to teach. Man, that would drive me crazy, but that's what they did. Now... That's why Jesus, if you don't know this, there is only one time in the entire scripture that Jesus gives the sermon at a synagogue service. Did you know that? One time. It's found in Luke chapter 4. This is the only time. And the reason why is this. The person given the sermon in a synagogue service, you either have to be born 
or have lived, you have to either live in that town or be born in that town. Where is Jesus? Where's the only time he gave a synagogue sermon? Nazareth. Okay, so Jesus, here's what it says in in chapter 4, verse 20. It says that he read the scripture, he gave it to the caretaker, the Hazan of the synagogue, and then he sat down and began to teach. That's exactly what they did. Okay, so here when it says Jesus sat down, what I want you to see over and over in scripture, you see Jesus sitting at times. Do you know why he does that? Because that's what you do as a teacher. It's the, it's the position of a teacher. They sit down when they're teaching. So Jesus was being arrested on the Mount of Olives. And you know what he says? He says, every day I used to sit in the temple teaching you. And you didn't seize me then. He didn't say I, I came and proclaimed. He said, no, I sat in the temple. It's because that's the position of a teacher. That's the position of authority. So that's important that he sat down. He's taking this position of authority. He's about to start teaching. And then it says, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. Okay? So he's about Jesus. What what Jesus is about to teach them is going to turn their world upside down. I mean, it's going to be absolutely unbelievable. Now, the reason why we spent 17 weeks going through the fruit of the Spirit is I want you to understand if we don't have hearts... That are sensitive to God in his spirit. We can preach all day long up here. We can give sermon after sermon. We can can go through this sermon on the mount. And and, and just word word by word detail even. And there will be no change in us. Unless we understand. That all of us have the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit wants to mold us and shape us. Into more like Jesus. Jesus. This Sermon on the Mount has no hope of bearing any fruit in our hearts. So you have to understand, all of this goes together, right? All of this goes together, that that we need Jesus to change us. And right here, imagine being on that hillside, and you've learned your entire life. It's about obeying the rules of the Torah. It's about obeying every single thing that God ever spoke to us. And then you have the Messiah coming and he turns your world upside down. Would you be okay with that? Would you be okay to say, you know what, God, man, I've never seen this before. You have changed what I thought kingdom would look like. I thought you were going to come and just slaughter the Romans and we'd all be seeing kumbaya. That's not what happened. Uh, You came to love the enemies? Are you serious, Jesus? Is that the best way of doing this? Would you be okay... If you're in their shoes and you hear Jesus say, no, 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 let me flip your world upside down. Everything that you studied in Torah from a little bitty boy or little girl, I'm about to flip upside down. Because that's where we are here. That's where we are. And here's what he says. I want your heart. It's not about obeying Torah. Simply. It's not about getting everything right outwardly. I want your heart. Now, James 2.20 says, faith without works is useless, right? If he has your heart, will it change your actions? Yes. See, we, I tend, when I grew up, and maybe, maybe your testimony is like mine. I don't know. My testimony is this. I spent years in church thinking it's about a list of do's and don'ts. Do this, and you're following the Lord. Stay away from those things. And if you start doing those things, that means you're not following the Lord. That was Christianity. That's also Judaism. That's exactly what these people were doing. It was a bunch of lists of rules to follow. And Jesus says, no, it's not about that. Let me up the ante. It's about your heart. I want you. It's not a bunch of lists to follow. See, Jesus did not come to be some sort of dictator. He says, you know what? You've got to understand you have a father. It's about a relationship. And that father loves you. And just like your own kids, when they mess up, you don't say, get out of here. 
as a father, when your kid's messed up, you say, I want to talk to you. I love you. I don't want you to have be hurt again. So let's talk about what happened because I don't want you to stay the same. But I'm not kicking you out of the family. And Jesus wants them to hear their father loves them. Even when they mess up. He wants their heart. And that's why, you know what, Matthew 4, he comes and he says things like, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come and have a relationship with me. And I'm going to use you if you do that. I, I don't know where you are this morning. As we get to this Sermon on the Mount, I don't want you to think this is about a bunch of list of rules necessarily. I want you to understand that, that, that Jesus looks at you and he says, I want you to know me. I want your heart. So how is your relationship with Jesus right now? Maybe this morning, before we get to the meat of the Sermon on the Mount, you realize I've negated my relationship with Jesus. I have not been in close fellowship with him. I've reverted back to it being a bunch of lists of, to, to, of rules to follow. Yeah, I'm staying away from all those bad things. So the world looks at me and they think I'm following Jesus. But you know in your heart, you're not really following him. Maybe this is that morning before we start the Sermon on the Mount that you come back in your heart and say, I'm going to follow you with everything I am, Jesus. Man, I think about him on the cross. And what he did for us, it wasn't so that we could get Leviticus right. It was, it was paying for all of the works that they had to do back then so that we could have that relationship with him. And that's what he invites us to. Not a list of do's and don'ts, but that relationship. As I was thinking this morning, this, just kinda, this verse kind of came to me that I, I want to share as we kind of close our time together. Listen to Ephesians 3. It talks about Christ in our hearts. Here's what it says. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. How's your relationship with Jesus? This is not a place to go through motions. This is a place to be real with one another, to do life together. To encourage one another. To share when we're struggling. That's what family does. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that, that this is not a bunch of list of things to do or don't do. Just that this is, God, family. Yes, it's family in this room, but it's also family with our Heavenly Father. Thank you for the freedom of family. Oh, God, you are so good. I pray for each and every heart here this morning. And I know that you want to richly dwell in us. That you want to feel at home in us. God, I pray that we would invest in that relationship with you. Thank you for that invitation that we can invest in you. 
that relationship. Teach us and mold us, God. Help us to be the family you've called us to be. So that the world will see your power. That you want to use a bunch of people that are weak in the world's eyes for your glory. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, guys, listen. This is the time, if you need to pray, you're always welcome to come up here, pray there where you are. It's not about where you pray. Let's, Let's let the Holy Spirit work. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. Say something real quick. Oh, yes. 
Are you leading this? Are you leading this, Samuel, or you want them to lead it? <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sheila. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Oh, uh, real quick, too. Guys, there's a lot of people out there. Some of them that we used to go to church with and aren't going anywhere. Guys, help us. Invite others. Who can you talk to? Lord's at work here. Who, who can you talk to this week and invite them into the family? Um, and just one more last reminder. If for parents or teachers, if you don't mind here in a couple minutes, just hanging around so we can discuss some things uh, about the, the kids and, and youth ministry, we'd appreciate it. So... Let me just pray us out real quick. One more prayer. Okay, God, thank you so much that you are at work here, that your spirit is welcome here. God, I look forward to that day, God, that we're all with you. But while we're still here, help us to consider our calling. To know that you have given us a mission. And God, may we be faithful to to just being led by the spirit, whatever you want to do here. God, I pray for us as we go this week. That we would be light in darkness. Shine through us, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.